question. Lord, give me your word to speak. Give me the power to preach and clarity of speech. Give your people ears to hear. That your word may sink in. That your word may not return empty, but accomplish that which you purpose. Succeed in the thing for which you send it. Create faith in us. And not just faith, but faithfulness. Send us empowered by your Holy Spirit here today out from here that we might give witness to you in thought, word, and deed. That we might point to you in all that we say and do. And when we don't or where we don't, forgive us. We pray all of this in trusting it into your merciful hands. The Lord, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel lesson from John chapter 12 begins with these words that there were some Greeks who came desiring to see Jesus. There were some Greeks who desired, wanted, willed, wished, had this deep down heart desire for Jesus Christ. To have Him as Lord of their lives, to, to center their life on Him and have everything in their life revolve around that relationship. There were Greeks who desired to see Jesus. And when that word comes to Jesus, you know what His response was? Ah, now's the time. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then He launches into this long diatribe that will last for chapters in John's Gospel known as the, uh, the Farewell Discourse where he now starts preparing his disciples for that time when he will be crucified and risen from the dead and ascend into heaven and he'll no longer physically be with them, but that he will be with them and never leave them or forsake them. That he'll send his holy angels to have charge of us and protect us, that he'll send the Holy Spirit to empower us, and that wherever two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, that Jesus will be present. That he will be with us and will never leave us or forsake us, right? But he won't be with us physically present like that anymore. And what triggers all of that conversation and all of that preparation for how to carry on in the Christian life and with this Christian mission? That there were some Greeks who came desiring to see Jesus. Now what is the significance of that? In John's Gospel, there's often different layers of things going on. What you see and hear on the surface and yet things that are underneath the surface, a hidden meaning or spiritual meaning or things like that. Like, for instance, in John chapter 9, you remember the story of the man born blind that Jesus healed? Uh, what you see on the surface is that this guy was healed and given sight, right? But there's more to the story than that. This guy who was given sight not only gets sight but insight. He not only comes to see, but he comes to believe that there's something deeper going on here. And he comes to testify and to witness to Jesus that he's the Christ, the Son of God. He, he makes the argument that, look, other people have been healed of blindness before, but never in the world or in history have we ever heard of anyone born blind who was healed. And who could possibly do such a thing unless this is God, that God has sent his Son, the Messiah has come. Now, the irony in the story is that the one who is blind ends up seeing, right? Not just seeing, but perceiving. And those who should be able to see this, the, the very people of God, the, the church, so to speak, the believers, so to speak, are blind and don't believe. The Pharisees want to lynch this guy for telling them the things about the God. They're the ones who have gone to church all their lives. They're the ones who know the promises and the prophecies. And you would dare to lecture us about the things of God, and yet the ones who should be able to see seem completely blind. So in the same way, in our gospel lesson this morning, this whole, the Greeks came desiring to see Jesus, and that launching everything that follows after that, there's something on the surface and something down below, something going on here. And this irony, too. The Greeks in John's gospel are the ones who represent the outsiders. And the Jews are the ones who represent the insiders, what we would call today the church, right? And in John's gospel, it's the Jews, the church, 
that are the ones who end up rejecting Jesus, end up the ones leading to Jesus' crucifixion. The, the, the Greeks, the outsiders, are the ones who desire to have this relationship with Jesus Christ and have him as Lord of their lives and their whole lives to center around him. And those who are the church, so to speak, are the very ones you would think that would be desiring that. And yet, they're the ones who rebel and reject all of this. I mean, talk about an indictment. Talk about something that ought to be troubling us here today. The very people who have been going to church or synagogue, given an hour to the Lord, so to speak, <laughs> seem to make no connection with that hour to the Lord and the rest of Sunday or Saturday or whatever, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The ones who, you know, show up and put 10, 20 bucks on the plate when they show up are hearing that their whole lives are being demanded of them. And they have a problem with this. The ones who are the church and at least are making a show of it. And whether that's to ease their conscience, whether that's uh, to make a good showing of it, whether that's to get by with the bare minimum requirements, thinking that that's what the whole faith is about is requirements. <laughs> They're the ones most troubled by all of this. Right after this, in fact, in John chapter 12, verse 40, I know it's not in your bulletin, but it is in your Bible. You can look it up. Trust me. It says this, that, that I, John starts quoting Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and following, where Isaiah is sent to preach to the people, and by preaching to the people God's word, God's indictment on them, that their ears will be stopped from listening, their eyes won't see, and their hearts will become more hardened, and that's, John says, what was happening with Jesus when he came and said this too. That's exactly what happened with the Jews, the church, in Jesus' day, and it is still true today. This may be my last Sunday. I thank you for <laughs> having me while it lasted, but I, I know that saying all of this can ruffle feathers, it can offend faith, and it can get pastors in trouble. The very people that are paying my salary, I am called to come and preach this word to. But that's what ends up happening. Is that not just the cost of discipleship is elevated and people are confronted with, but there are also all these community implications that people don't like. That Jesus is welcoming the Greeks and the undesirables that he's been keeping company with. What are the implications for us today? As a friend recently said to me, you know, if you're going to church and it's not real comfortable because now you're sitting around people that you aren't real comfortable with because maybe some of them, well, maybe some of them stink or don't dress well enough for your standards. Or conversely, maybe some of them smell too good and dress up too nice and I don't want to be around such people or maybe that whether it's they're too too poor or too rich and I'm not real comfortable around such people or maybe it's that they're too old or conversely maybe they're too young maybe some are too noisy and clap during worship and maybe others are just too pious or too stoic and seem to have no expression of the faith. Or maybe some are too pious, too proper, and some seem too inappropriate. Or maybe some seem too conservative for my taste, or others seem too liberal for my liking. Or maybe some are just too Lutheran and others aren't Lutheran enough, or the list could go on and on and on, but the reality is if you're getting into a community where you're just not appreciating the company that you're sitting around, you're not comfortable with it anymore, then perhaps you're home. You're in the Christian church. You're in the very community of faith that Jesus Christ is trying to create and calls us to. Perhaps it's for such a time as this and a place as this 
that you're being called. Jesus says to his disciples, by the way, when he says to the disciples, you've got to realize the disciples are Jews. So within that churched people, that community of faith, the Jews who largely are offended and rejecting and, and uncomfortable with Jesus and the community he's creating and the discipleship he's calling us to, for all of those Jews, there are Jews within the community that are following Jesus, that do have a heart for Jesus like these Greeks who have come that have given up everything to follow, but lest you start pointing the finger and saying, yeah, that's me, but I'm not so sure about him or her and those sitting around me. You can't tell who the true disciple, if there is even such a thing, is or is not. For Judas gave up everything to follow Jesus. Peter, James, and John, their discipleship had limits, just as Peter when the cock crowed. So the reality is we can't tell whether we are that person or the people sitting around us are that people, but there are people who, like these Greeks and like Jeremiah talks, where the gospel has been written on our hearts and has done something to us and for us that we can do no other, right? And Jesus says to his disciples, my soul is troubled by all of this. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour? Lord, why should I have to go and die for a bunch of people who are rejecting you, who want nothing to do with you, or who come once a week and say they want everything to do with you, but then don't really live it out the rest of their lives? Why should I come and sacrifice my life for all of them? Is that what I should say? Father, save me from this hour? And Jesus says, no. It is for this hour that I have come. It is for to such as these that I give my life. What good is it if you love those who love you? Jesus says elsewhere. Any Joe Schmo or Sally Sue can do that. Or as Mordecai once said to Esther in the Old Testament, perhaps it is for just such a time as this that you are being called that you're being called to sacrifice. It is to such as these, Jesus says, that I have come to give my life. For this hour I have come. Is there any hope that eyes that have been shut will one day see? Is there any hope that ears that refuse to hear will be opened and listen? Is there any hope that hearts that have been hardened and protect ourselves, whether it's our pocketbook protection or our calendar protection or uh, our lives and just not wanting to have to give more? Is, is there any hope for the hearts that have been hardened that I really don't want to be around such people? <laughs> is there any hope that those hearts will be broken into and broken down? And I believe there is. I believe I have the faith. I do not know that I will see it in my lifetime. That's my doubting Thomas nature of me. But I do believe I have this faith that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That promise that is in Scripture, I believe that it will come true, even if it's not in my time. And I believe that that is true because Jesus says this. Is there any hope? Yes. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, and he's referring, John says, not to his resurrection or his ascension into heaven, but to the manner in which he died, his crucifixion. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, there I will draw all people to myself. There every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father, that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day, everyone will eventually come to see this and say, oh, what love the Father has given that a sinner such as I would be called a child of God. And that is what we are. Amen.